Good morning. It's great to see y'all. Um, yeah, so our hearts are heavy for Pike. I was down there early once it was getting launched. Tons of volunteers down there. But yes, come and greet and welcome and all the things. But uh, you probably have seen uh, the story of Pike Peterson. It's been on, I think, Channel 4, Channel 5, 11, wherever. It's been out all over the place because there's a lot of people in our city rallying around Pike. I was able to see him Yesterday, he's in good spirits. He's an amazing young man, 13 years old, as noted. Pray for the family. Let's, let's covenant to pray. And make your way down uh, to the gym before you head to lunch, and you could literally be part of saving someone's life. That doesn't happen every day. So I hope that we will, we're, we're praying that we'll find a match, even among us, uh, which would be a beautiful thing. Today, as noted, we're talking about friendship. And this is a topic, passionate topic of mine. Uh, I believe that friendships are one of the greatest gifts of God's grace, often underestimated, even uh, disregarded at times. Maria Paul, uh, as an author, wrote a book entitled The Friendship Crisis. You probably know this is a thing. The subtitle, Finding, Making, and Keeping Friends When You're Not a Kid Anymore. Because when we're kids, you go to the playground or wherever else, you're a kid, I'm a kid, we're besties, let's go. Let's play. Then we grow up and something happens. And ironically, what we thought some years ago would be a thing, social media would connect us more with other people. Most experts point to social media itself, online engagement and friends, as one of the great problems in an effort to draw us together through technology, it's actually accelerated the distance that we have with people. Uh, A study that I read this week called the Friendscape Crisis reveals what a lot of us know. There's been a lot of research done on this over the past 30 years, especially in the past five, it's been accelerated where there are more and more Americans, more than ever before, who say they have no close friends and more and more Americans who cannot identify who they would call a best friend. Now, I know you start qualifying friendships and that gets a little wonky because we have a lot of different kinds of friendships. I have multiple best friends, if you will, at different stages or places in my life, even today. But my hot take on the solution for Isolation that leads to depression, anxiety, and loneliness. It's friendships. That's it. And I'm going to raise the level of Christian friendships among us, and I want to challenge you. You're already thinking. I want to challenge you. Go deeper with friends you already have. And if you don't have a best friend, close friends in your life, I'm going to challenge you, men in particular, but women as well, be courageous. Like step up, be the man. Women, be the woman that says, I need friends in my life. And I think through God's word, you're going to see that this is the case. We're going to look at the most famous friendship in all the Bible. It's in 1 Samuel 18, among other places. Anybody want to guess who we're going to look at as a model? Jonathan and David. And what I've learned through this studying again, wow, Jonathan is the man, by the way. Uh, We often look at David. Um, We know all of David's faults because we have more on his life than anybody in scripture, more volume of stuff other than Jesus. And so we're just going to do this. I'm going to do something a little different today. uh, They don't always do. Now, if you're new, you wouldn't know this, but I'm going to draw from, I'm going to tell a story. Okay. We're going to look at the narrative arc of the story. Then we're going to go back and make application. So we're going to, you need your Bible open always the text for this course. Okay. Uh, make you lazy by putting the scripture on the screens. But look in the word of God. We're reading dwell together through the book of Romans. You can grab your uh, bookmark today if you don't have it already. Okay, so we're going to start. Now, most of you know David uh, and, and the, out of the story of David and Goliath. Most people know that, whether you're uh, you know, familiar with the Bible or not. Uh, right after that, Saul is like, wait, who is, who's, your, who's your daddy? <laughs> you know, who is this? Um, though he's already had some engagement with, with him. And after they finished talking, as soon as, here it is, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, Jonathan is is Saul's son. You might know that. He's the king, Saul. And he's half-hearted for God. He's kind of a mess a lot of the times, uh, as we'll see. But Jonathan is amazing. 
And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. It's like, hey, no, you're, you're with us now. You're going to come and live in the palace. You're, you're, you're my bro, right? You're my friend. In verse 3, then Jonathan made a covenant, watch this, with David, heir to the throne, because he loved him as his own soul. This is a metaphor for transparency and openness. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, gave it to David, put it on him, his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. He's essentially, he's handing over the throne to David because as much as he perceives that God is leading David to be the next king. He's already been anointed, by the way, by Samuel. But he's the next king as much as he believes it. Uh, his father Saul does not. We, he will see he, he is struggling, though everybody else sees that he's the man. Verse 5. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. So that Saul set him over the, over the men of war, becomes like the general over the army. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So everybody perceived this is the man and he's on this trajectory to become God's person. Okay. And then verse nine, uh, chapter 19, verse one, and Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son and all of his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, I will be on guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. This becomes a pattern. This is just another snapshot of many where Jonathan is stepping between Saul and David, his friend, to protect his life and save his life, even putting his own life on the line. This happens for a long time. About four years he's, he's, he's doing this while uh, David, for probably seven years or so, he's living in the palace. And then in chapter 20, Jonathan, David devise a plan. This is another little snapshot. You can turn to chapter 20 where they say, hey, is he still coming after me? This is going on for a long years. It's a lot of time while, while David's writing a lot of the Psalms of, of protection and pleading with God. Can you imagine somebody coming after you? And you never know when they're going to kind of show up and even take your life. So they develop this plan where Jonathan is out uh, practicing, you know, he's shooting his bow, his arrows, and he has a servant with him, assistant, who runs and gets the bow. The, the arrows and comes back to him. He says, hey, if I shoot beyond him, David's watching, hiding out, then you'll know that, that you need to stay hidden because it means that my dad is still after you, if you can believe it. Then in chapter 20, um, in verse 41, it says this, and as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face. He comes to see Jonathan again. And he falls on the ground and bows three times. It's a way of just paying homage and honor to his friend. And, and he just, again, he's just undone by the love that Jonathan has for him and the fact that he's running for his life. He's tired. And he's weary. It says they kissed one another and they wept with one another. David weeping the most. And then Jonathan said to David, go in peace because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord that the Lord shall be between you and me. It's interesting kind of idiom. The Lord is, we think, between us. Um, there's, he's saying, no, he's the one at the center of the relationship. He's the one who binds us together. He's the one that's gluing us, sticking us together here. And, and it's between us and my offspring and your offspring. Forever, friends, is what we are. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. And then in chapter 21 and 22, keep tracking with me, David uh, is general in the, uh, he's, he's going into all these wars and he's, while he's taking out and, and fighting for the people of Israel, uh, he's running for his life as well. And, and then in, in chapter 23, flip there to verse 15, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. 
So all my father also knows this. He's saying, everybody knows you're the man, even my father. And then in verse 18, and the two of them made a covenant. They renewed their covenant together before the Lord. Uh, David remained at Horesh and Jonathan went home. Little did they know this would be the last time they'd see each other. In chapter 24, David's hiding out in a, in a cave from Saul. Saul goes into the cave. You might know this story. Uh, David and his men are back further in the cave. We've actually seen this cave on our uh, Holy Land trip. But David goes in. Saul goes in to relieve himself. It's in the Bible. And, and then, so Saul, though, while he's in there, Saul, I mean, David's able to take part of his robe. Maybe you know the story. Just, to, just this stealth move on it to show him later, hey, I could have killed you. And Saul is in, in initially touched by that, but his pride and his greed, his desire to keep power won't let him go. And, and so what happens then in a foolish move, Saul uh, leads all of his men into a, a, a war, a battle that he should have never gone into on Mount Gilboa. And what happens is all of his sons, including Jonathan, are killed in the battle. Saul is injured, ends up taking his own life and their bodies are taken to this town we went to as well. The ruins are still there. You can see Bet Shein um, in the Holy Land. And their body, they, sorry, their heads are cut off. They're placed on a wall. And that was the end of Saul, Jonathan, and the family. Now, I'm giving you enough snapshots there to see the power of this friendship and some of the ebb and flow, the emotions involved in this powerful, beautiful friendship. Because nowadays, here's the thing, we pretend to have friends. Let's be honest, we, we have friends. And what we see here is something very different. What I'm gonna call forever friends. And I hope that you have forever friends. That's my great hope for you because I know the power of forever friends in my life, but they're in, forever friends, in community, okay, common unity, and that is the body of Christ. I hope you have great Christian friends. We're going to talk a lot about that today, the power and the gift that they are. Uh, but in community, we have a common purpose. We're going to see it here. Well, a common passion, first of all. We have a common purpose, and we have a common person in the midst of our friends, friendships that make it a wonderful, beautiful thing. So first, a common passion. Now, compassion, the, the, you know, the combination of these words, means to suffer with. That, that's, that's not what I'm talking about here so much, though it is that, we'll see. But common, I'm talking about a common interest, a common passion that you have. This is what links two people together. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a great book you may know called The Four Loves. One of those is friendship love. Okay, And in that essay, that portion of a powerful book, he talks about how every friendship really starts with, with this expression, you too? I thought I was the only one. And friends are formed, right? But what happens when it's the spirit of God that goes, you, wait, you? Like, wait, I, you love God too? That's what happens with Jonathan and David, right? That is the power of a great friendship. And the Lord knits them together. He knits us together with a common desire for him. And that common desire in Christ leads us to love the other freely and, and encourage. That is a powerful friendship. I do hope that you have friends like that in your life. We're all thinking about different friends we have or lack of friends or those that we go, you know what? And here's my challenge for some, all of us. Reach out to your friend today. If you have a Jonathan in your life, maybe several, I want you to reach out to them this week. Maybe you write a note. Who does that anymore? And just say, you, you mean the world to me. Give them a call and say, I have been reminded of how, what a gift of grace, what an un, unexpressible gift of grace you are in my life. I had a friend, a couple of friends this week. I did just that. I'm ahead of you. But I've got forever friends and I have a dear friend uh, literally named Jonathan. And I reached out to him this week to just tell him how much I love him. I've told you about a group of three friends that I have who were blowing up, you know, my, my phone this morning. Hey, aren't you preaching on friendship this morning? And, um, you know, they're praying for me and all the things. And wow, it's just amazing. But, you know, as, as, as all of this in a culture that focused much more on family than we do today. And we can have friends in family, but here's the truth. Your friend, your family's going to be with you. I hope. I mean, not all of us. We, families get jacked up. Am I right? Okay. We can, because here's the thing. You, family might stick with you, 
Uh, they'll be with, when I'm in a hospital room when someone's dying, it's generally family. They may not like each other, but they're there together. It's like when I do a wedding or something, you know, like, whoo, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot, you know, but that's all of us, right? The point is, you can be really close. Families will, will stick together because you're family. That's beautiful. Um, you don't choose your family. You choose your friends. And even more beautiful, your friends choose you. And God chose you, yes, to place you in a family. And the most beautiful families are those that are friends, right? That we can be friends together. But a family, uh, yes, is awesome. But my point is, there are friendships that run deeper than families. That's not slamming families. I'm just saying, that's how God's designed us. Because in, early in your life, your family makes you who you are. But throughout your life, particularly in our transient society we live in, friend, friends make you. The quality of your friendships will determine who you are. That's why it says in Proverbs, if you walk with wise, you'll become wise. It also says, you know, you know Proverbs 18, 24, a man of many companions may come to ruin. Oh, lot, I got lots of friends. I'm good. Pretending. But there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. This word sticks is the word I thought it was. I had a hunch. It's the same word that we find in Genesis 2, 24 that says um, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave. That's the word. Stick to his wife. The, uh, the writer, I've said this many times in a wedding or something, you know, I had one last night, but uh, it's the strongest word the author can use to say these two are stuck together. They're glued together. This is why David says, hey, you know what's between us? The glue that is God. He sticks us together. Jesus sticks us together as brothers and sisters. There's nothing like it on the planet. And I'm challenging you to run after Christian friends, to go deeper with Christian friends because they will stick. You can't make it through life without Christian friends. Just telling you. You can't make it through the hardest times of your life. You can't grow in the Lord without Christian friends. See, see friends bring something into your life that others don't, you don't find in family, frankly, in dating, in romantic relationships, or coworkers, classmates. See, family, again, they're obligated. Friends are just those who say, I'm going to give you my life. Now, in the best case scenarios, praise be to God, um, you can marry your best friend. But even there, uh, as I've married, my, Stacy, my best friend, but she can't provide for all of my needs. I'm kind of a needy guy. I mean, I got a lot of needs. Um, and, and so friends, friends step in. In, in multifaceted ways, right? And bring perspective in life that not one single person can bring. And, and, and to put that on a spouse, that, that'll crush another person. I need everything from you. I need your time. I need your energy. I need you to tell me about this. I need you to help me with this. And if you don't have close friendships that are loving, here's what happens. You don't learn how to live a selfless life outside of friendships, because in friendships, you have to die to yourself. The, the word really common passion is the word sympathy. Sim means together or at the same time. Pathos, passion. I thought about that word. Sympathy. We have sympathy for one another. And many of you, let me ask you, do you have friends like this? Do you have friends that you are stuck together for life? They made a covenant with one another. Now, kids do that. We don't always do that, but there's probably a time. Some of you need to kind of DTR. You need to define the relationship. And whether it's said or not, it might be a good thing for you. Here's another application. With a friend to say, hey, I just want to say, you know, you and I have been friends. Maybe short time, maybe long time. I need you in my life. Now, I, I, we need to be more intentional. Because, you know, we have the same passion. And what we're going to talk about next, we, we have the same purpose. We have a common purpose. David and Jonathan shared a common purpose and they were committed regardless of the cost. The problem in our day is that we've lost the purpose of Christian friendships, the power of Christian friendship. It's, it's like people getting married much later in life who don't even know what marriage is anymore. A lot of us have lost the vision of Christian friendship. And, and so we don't have or value it as we should. Our culture focuses much more on romantic sexual relationships, right, than anything else. In fact, many years ago, more than 50 years ago, 
in his book, Lewis writes this. He says, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all loves, the crown of life and the school of virtue. In the modern world, in comparison, we ignore it. And this is, a, this is written many years ago, and I think now even more so. We, we lack compelling, beautiful role models in our lives of friends together. Think about it. Rarely do you go to a movie, read a book, hear songs about the value and quality of deep abiding friendships. Some stories, maybe. Most of them are about romantic sexual love because we sexualize everything in our culture. Instead of just saying, hey, here's who God created me. I'm going to bow to that. I'm going to give my life to that. But I need friends in my life who will show me how to live. And in this secular age, the focus is not on common unity, common passion and purpose. You know what it is? It's, more, it's focused on the individual, like everything else in life. I will determine what my life will be like. I'll determine where this goes. And like the purpose of marriage, many of us have forgotten the purpose of friendship, which is to make me more like Jesus. And, and what happens too often is that friendship in the secular world, it's friends with benefits, right? And I mean, that plays across culture. I want to ask you, let's be honest. How many friends do you have? And there's no law of reciprocity. Because this starts early on. As a young kid, I want to be with the cool kids. I'm going to sit with them at school. I want to sit at that table. I want to be popular. How many friends do I have on Instagram or wherever else? And it's a law of reciprocity. Often, then we grow up. Hey, I want to be in that group. I need to know that guy. He might help me to get to where I want to be. She is the one who knows all these people. I, we see that all over the place. And what happens is then friends become tools for our enjoyment or engagement or to raise us up. That is a self-centered friendship. That's not a friendship where Christ is at the center gluing the two together. See, relationships apart from selfless love in Christ are always going to become self-focused and, 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 and self-centered in our desires. But the beauty of true friendship is not like that. We can show the world a better way. Christian friends, that's, again, grace is one-way love, not about status, money, or prestige. It's about showing the love of Christ. And nor is it always, watch this, it's not always marriage. I talked to one of our singles after the first service, and this is so true. In the church, we can often elevate, even idolize marriage as like the goal. And I said it in a, a wedding last night with a lot of single people there. Marriage is, not, marriage is not the prize. Jesus is the prize. Life is not, am I dateable, am I marriageable? Christ is the prize. And if you don't get that in your marriage, you're going to have a mess of a time. If he's not prize, the one you're seeking, the one you're pushing each other to, then you're going to have trouble in marriage. And I say that because I want to encourage our single adults. You are not, you're not a lesser you know, individual or something. All of us are at the same place, needing Jesus, needing friendships. That's what I'm trying to say is not, i got to get married. No, you need great and deep friendships. That's for all of us here. And that's my great challenge for us today. He says, the Lord will be between us, right? We talked about this last week. Let me just say this because there are parallels. In marriage, if you're married, um, in that household code passage we looked at last week in Ephesians 5, well, we looked at Colossians 3. In Ephesians 5, Paul says at the beginning of it, he says in verse 18, he says, um, hey, be filled with the Spirit. That's his first umbrella statement, command, because we can't love each other without the Spirit of God in us. You can't do it in marriage. You can't do it in friendships. We can't have agape one-way love. We don't do that without the power of God and grace in our life. He says, so be filled with the Spirit. Then he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So in healthy relationship, this is true in marriage, it's true in friendships, we defer to one another. Like in that passage, we often run to, um, okay, wives, submit to your husbands. Amen. You know. Um, no, here's what this means. In the context, he says, 
Husbands, love your wife at just like Jesus loves us. Die to yourself. And here's how, here's how I like to paraphrase that. Husbands, love your wife just like Jesus. And wives, let him do that. But we're both called to love like Jesus. We both, in friendships, we die to ourselves and say, I'm in this for you. I mean, you give a lot to me. You bring a lot. That's, that's partly why I'm here because the Lord has knit us together. But I'm here for you. But friends, regardless of your age, I'm challenging towards friends like this and you to apply this in your life. When it says that he is, he says, I'm, he loved him with his soul. Again, this is a symbol of, of transparency. In friendships, we share our faults because we can be trusted. We share our failures. We, 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 we stick at all times because a friend loves at all times, never gives up. And we also lovingly confront one another. That's another aspect of a godly friendship. Bonhoeffer writes this, nothing can be more cruel than the leniency which abandons others to their sin. Nothing can be more compassionate than the severe reprimand which calls another Christian in one's community back from the path of sin. It's out of his, his classic exploration on community and Christian friendship called Life Together. Friends, we all can have friends like this. I want to challenge our young people here. Children, students, teenagers. I want to challenge you. You have some friends even now. And I want to challenge you. And as you get older, stick. Some will stick. Some will stick. But you got to be intentional. And then as you get older, you have to stay in touch over the years. And uh, again, I've talked a lot about my core friends that I have in my life. Um, I praise God that Stacy, my best friend, uh, provides so much for me. But she can't. She can't provide, again, all that I need. Other friends can do that. I have this multifaceted group of friends, and I think diverse friends as well. I Maybe mean, that's a challenge for some of us who are saying, man, I got good friends. Praise God. Express that to the Lord. Thank him for it. But here's what's interesting. Before the fall, think about this. Maybe you've, you've heard this before, but Adam, okay, before, he's in paradise. And God said, it is not good. For him to be alone. And yes, that's a model of marriage as we move, you know, in, into all of life and community and they're called to flourish together and multiply and all the things. But none of us can live without friendship and relationship. And again, we don't always run to marriage. Not everyone, your, your need is not going to be found there. Not ultimately. We know that it's found in Christ. And so here's the challenge I have for you. How do you find friends like this? Well, one place you can find them is right here in the church. And I just, I just challenge you. Are you, some of you are serving, you know, come to worship. Are you serving the Lord? Maybe you're not in a, in a connect group and you're not among Christian friends. And as we challenge each other to have longevity and friendships, I want you to, to watch something here we're showing today of the value of long uh, Christ-centered friendships. Watch this. I'm Carolyn Probes. And I'm Bill Probes. And I happen to be married to her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Judy Osteen. I'm Sam Osteen. We've been We've married. 54, 55 in February. We came to Park Cities in March of 1985, and we immediately went to a Sunday school class that met in the steeple. And so the Osteens were in that department, and we met them then. Carolyn stood out to me because she volunteered in Bible drill when our kids were participating. And we started sharing uh, burdens, prayer requests, and our faith has been strengthened by how our Christian friends handle it. Yeah, I think we started, we were like young adults one or two. They never tell you exactly, but now we're in the legacy class. So. Adult seven. I, was I don't know what that is now, but <laughs> that tells you how long ago it was. Your Park Cities gives you lots of opportunities to serve in many different ways. And so I think that's when we've made some of our best friendships, working together for somebody else. And we've made friends through Vickery Meadow, volunteering yeah. at Jack Lowe. There are just so many opportunities to serve. If someone who is not 
you know, hadn't decided what church they're gonna go to, if they're of a mind to serve, <laughs> you, you'll get plenty of opportunities here. Well, one of the things that means the most to us right now is our Connect group meets on Wednesday morning. And this, this has brought such a, a good thing for us. And the whole point of this is, is the Bible study and studying God's Word. And the Connect group is such an important part. And so many people just come to church. So that's one thing I would always emphasize. That We've even had people come that are not members of our church but they like to come on Wednesday morning. It's been an outreach. Church gives you the opportunity to meet friends from other neighborhoods. We've just really enjoyed the, the friendships across Dallas. You know, our first relationship, our closest relationship is with the Lord. But a lot of times we've found that when we have special needs, I mean, special problems, the Lord sends people, probes and others that kind of put arms and prayers around us when we need it. Now, when my uh, granddaughter was diagnosed with cancer, uh, my Christian friends were the first ones that I called and told about to, to pr please pray for her. And it's been a, such a blessing, hasn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, you have friendships with your neighbors, but it's not always praying type friends, you know, that share your same deep faith and trust in the Lord. It's been a long, good pathway. Wow. You know, isn't that beautiful? I want to go to Connect Group in the steeple. What is, what's up with that? <laughs> That's amazing. I love the, I love the probes, the Osteens. Those things were neighbors of ours, literally, um, some years ago in Lake Highlands. And just the beauty of, of longevity and friendship. So how do you find, how do you, how do you get there? How do you find friends like that? Be one. Did you hear? They, they met and they served together. So there was already a heart of grace towards others. Some of you need to make some moves, okay? Some of you need to, application, need to join a connect group. We say that often, but come on. You need to, or maybe it's like you need, no, you need to serve. Because here's what can happen. In, in friendship, there's all kinds of, of different types of friendships, right? We have, we have a, a Paul who's discipling us. Who's that in your life? We have Barnabas comes alongside us encouraging us. Who's that? And who are you discipling? Because I'm, I'm looking across the crowd here, and I know that many of you are opening up your home. You become a tool, an instrument for others, like a crew group in your, in your house. You're allowing students to connect with friends, desperately needing friends. I, I see my friend, uh, Chris Hill, Michelle, uh, Chris told me this week, he's starting again, launching again, a group of fifth graders, um, in his home, in their home, uh, you know, when is that Friday mornings, I think, uh, which he's been doing for years, a, a safe place for kids just to come. Let's talk about God before we go to school. Let's talk about the Lord. Let's develop deep friendships off the field, the court, wherever else in the classroom. Let's go deeper. Some of you can do that right now. And I just challenge you, you can be the person that's drawing people together. And, and, and there's so many opportunities here. We've got uh, Men's Connect Lunch that we had this week, connecting men with other men. And to go deeper, we've got another dad's pop-up coming up in Lake Highlands. Watch for it. Anybody can come. But if you live over there, I'll be there. We're talking about being dads. We have a common passion, right? A common purpose. There's a lot of opportunities. Men, women, all ages. Contact Caleb Rhodes, by the way who's our men's ministry coordinator, you can uh, contact him. We need men who will mentor younger men and women who will mentor younger women. In a cross-generational church, it's a beautiful thing. But here's the thing. We'll land with this. There's a common passion. We have a common purpose, but we know that in, in Christ we have a common person. Jesus said this. This is John 15. Jesus said in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Wow, the little word as, by the way. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you, for, call you my servants. 
For the servant does not know what the master's doing. The master knows what's up. He tells others what to do. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father. I've made it known to you. I've shared everything. You're an insider now. Jesus, the friend of sinners, calls us in sinners, calls me and you into friendship with him. And he lays down his life for us so that we would be his friends. Some of you know that the story of David and Jonathan does not end in 1 Samuel chapter 9, 19, wherever we, we got to, 24. It goes to 2 Samuel, and in chapter 9, after Jonathan dies many years later, you got one of the most beautiful pictures of grace in all of the Bible. It says in 2 Samuel 9, Verse 1, David says, hey, is there anyone that I can bless in Jonathan's family? Because sometimes forever friends continue to bless the friends, the family of others who've been with you in days formerly. And in verse 3, and the king said, is there not someone still, someone of the house of Saul? that I may show the kindness of him or of God to him? Ziba, he was a, a servant within the, the royal household, said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan and he is crippled in his feet. Mephibosheth couldn't walk. He'd been uh, unable to walk since, since birth and in that society, you would have been, become an outcast. And so David says, King David, says, where is he? And so they bring Mephibosheth in, son of, Saul, of, of Jonathan. And it says also, son of Saul, who was the, right, the, his grandfather, sought to kill David. And he comes before David and he falls on his face before the king to pay homage to him as one would do. And David sh- says, Mephibosheth. And then Mephibosheth says, behold, I'm your servant. And David said to him, here it is, verse 7. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. A little boy, again, broken, crippled, comes, unable to walk, an outcast, and he's invited to the king's table. This story resonates with us so much because this is the gospel. Listen to verse 11, then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my Lord, the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. He says, I'm going to take care of him. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. So now there's many years later. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate always at the king's table. And then it closes by saying, now remember, he was lame. He couldn't walk. It reminds us of our brokenness. We can't walk. We can't run to Jesus. He comes to us one way love. He finds you friends. He's finding you today. If you've never received Christ as your best friend, you'll never have the friendships or the life that you're meant to live here on this earth and into eternity. Christ came. He died on the cross for you. He's now king of kings. He's Lord of lords. Even as Harper proclaimed as we started our service to say, Christ is Lord of my life. I lay down my life because he has sought me out to be his friend. And now friends, we have a friend in Jesus who will never leave us nor forsake us. The gospel says that though broken and orphaned without a place, the king invites you to his table to enjoy all of the gifts that he has for us, passion, purpose, and a person who is the prize, Christ himself, our friend. Praise be to God. Amen.